Good morning, sunshines. <laughs> All right, so last class period, we talked about the American Musical Theater and how it's got its beginnings in vaudeville with uh, Florence Zigfield. Uh, there had also been some inklings of musical types of theater before uh, in England, uh, especially with the operettas of Gilbert Sullivan. Oh, Gilbert Sullivan. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, there are two types of musicals. There's uh, the uh, integrated musical, which is the uh, musicals that include uh, the, the, the songs foster the plot. And then there are what are gonna be called concept musicals. Concept musicals are musicals that are about a basic idea. For instance, one of the things we're gonna talk about today is a musical called Cats. Uh, I hope you have not seen the movie, because uh, it's on the list of all time worst movies. Uh, but uh, Cats is a concept musical. It's a bunch of songs about cats. Uh, you could take out any particular song and you would, have, you would have no idea it was there or not there. Uh, so those are the two types of musicals. One where the songs are about a basic subject matter and one where the, the songs in the show actually further the plot line. Again, those are called integrated musicals. Probably the greatest composer of the second half of the century is a man named Stephen Sondheim. Uh, Stephen Sondheim was born in 1930. It's still alive, last time from the check. Uh, he's about to be 90 years old. So congratulations, Stephen Sondheim. Um, he learned to play the piano at age nine uh, uh, on Long Island. His family had a house that was just down the street from Oscar the Hammerstein II. So Rogers and Hammerstein, the Hammerstein of Rogers and Hammerstein, taught St the young Stephen Sondheim how to play the piano, which is a great connection. Um, his shows, um, one of the great things about Stephen Sondheim, as opposed to some of the people we talked about before, so for instance, in King and I, the music doesn't really sound Siamese. Uh, this music is just popular music that they just happen. The Mikado just has, you know, happens to happen in Japan. Uh, one of the things about Sondheim's music is the music takes the form uh, and the style and the period and the sound of the place where it's happening. And so he is one of the best composers at incorporating the sound, the music of the type of the sound you're going to hear of the place where he is playing the music. Uh, so, for instance, uh, let's just start with West Side Story. Um, out of college, his first composite, composing gig uh, was, uh, was Leonard Bernstein, who was one of the great American uh, classic composers, uh, was the musical West Side Story. Now, Sondheim only wrote the lyrics to that. Bernstein wrote the music to it. Um, Arthur Renz directed it. Um, uh, the the um, uh, musical opened in 1957, and it is a, basically a modern telling of the story of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, so you have these two gangs, the Sharks and the Jets, and the song I'm about to show you is a, play, a song called Somewhere. Uh, and the important thing isn't just the song and how beautiful the song is, but how the song happens. Uh, you have uh, Tony and Maria are two lovers, there's Romeo and the Juliet, uh, and they are thinking that there's the world around them is caving in, uh, and they're longing for some place uh, that in their life somewhere there's a place that they will find to live together. And you can see that the dialogue blends almost seamlessly into the music. Uh, and so they're, they're literally just having a conversation, the music picks up underneath the conversation, and then suddenly from, goes from just having a conversation to actually singing the words, and you see that there's, they don't stop and take a breath and suddenly we're singing. Uh, that's the way Sondheim works. His, his music is integrated so seamlessly into the, the, the plot of the play that you don't even know that the character has begun to sing. So enjoy some. Stay, stay with me. Maria, I love you so much. Don't leave me. Whatever you want, I'll do. Oh, oh forever. Tighter. It'll be all right, I know it. We're really together now. But it's not us. If everything around us. Then I'll take you away, when nothing can get to us. Not anyone, or anything. There's a place for us. Somewhere a place for us. Peace and quiet and open air Wait for us somewhere There's a time for us Someday a time for us Time together with time to spend Way of living, we'll find a way 
Totally, uh, Sondheim wrote 18 different Broadway musicals. He also wrote 12 films. Um, he was nominated for 10 uh, uh, Tony Awards for Best Score, and he won eight times. Pretty good record. Um, the, um, uh, in addition to West Side Story, his second musical was a shooting musical called Gypsy, which again, he just composed the lyrics for, but after that, he had a string of musicals that were all, he composed both the music and the lyrics. The funny thing happened on the, the forum, uh, which was based on a, a Roman play. Uh, anyone can whistle. Uh, his first major hit musical that he composed both the music and the words to is a musical called A Little Night Music, uh, which is set in three quarters time and set as a waltz. Uh, it's, again, very period styles. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let you watch a video of it because you can see how different it is and how different it sounds from West Side Story. It's funny or not, I'll give you a fuller report the minute they carry me back. When now I still want and or love you, now as always, now. Liaisons, what's happened to them? Liaisons today. Would you? Of course. <laughs> Pearls and servants and dressing for festivals. Friday nights with him all entails. We'll have dancing. Have faith to some degree. The least that I can do is trust in her the way that Charlotte trusts in me. Every day a little sting in the heart and in the head. Every move and every breath, and you hardly feel a thing, brings a perfect little death. Making my entrance again with my usual flair. Sure of my lines, no one is there. Of course the summer night smiles three times. But why does it smile, Grandmother? At the follies of human beings, of course. <laughs> Again, the hit song from that show was a, a song called Sin and the Clowns that actually made it to number one. Uh, not necessarily the Broadway version, but there was a version of it that was sung uh, by a lady in the 60s that, uh, that made the charts. Um, among his other great musicals, again, 18 total, uh, Sweeney Todd is my favorite. Again, I'm going to show you a little video from uh, Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd, is a, uh, uh, he wrote it in order to see if he could scare an, an, an audience. And trust me, when you're in a theater, uh, it is scary. Um, <laughs> but th this is a song which uh, counterposes the fact that Sweeney Todd wants to slit this judge's throat with the idea that the two of them are fantasizing about different women in their lives. And so there's this underlying tension in the scene where you think and you know that Sweeney Todd's about to slit this guy's throat. And uh, again, you'll see how the music just takes up out of the dialogue of the scene and how the scene just moves on seamlessly after the song actually stops. So enjoy it pretty much. You see, sir, a man infatuated with love, her ardent and eager slave. So fetch the pomade and pomade stone and lend me a more seductive tone, a sprinkling perhaps of French cologne. But first, sir, I think a shave. The closest I ever gave. Mr. Todd. Tis your delight, 
water catching fire from one man to the next. Tis true, as our love can still inspire the blood to pound the heart leap higher. What more? What more can, can man require than love, sir? More than love, sir. What, sir? Women. Ah, yes, women. Pretty women. And that's the same way we use, uh, in art, we, we do art. You have to create bit by bit uh, each part of the component, and together when you step back, you have this beautiful piece of art. Uh, he also wrote Into the Woods, which was made into a movie recently. Um, so he was very prolific as an artist. Um, uh, I would say if there was one artist that I felt like should have received a Nobel Prize uh, that hasn't yet, I would say Sondheim is the guy. Uh, Sondheim worked hand in hand with a man named Hal Prince. Hal Prince was his producer. Hal Prince was both a producer and a director. Uh, again, uh, he directed and produced several shows, but for the most part, he, when he was working on a show and he produced the show, he didn't actually direct. Uh, we'll show a couple of examples here in a second. Uh, but with Sondheim, he worked on nine different shows. Eight of them made it to Broadway, and six of the eight shows that made it to Broadway won the award for best musical of that year. Uh, among them Company, uh, uh, Follies, uh, we talked about Little Night Music, uh, Sweeney Todd. Uh, and so they were very prolific together. Hal Prince lived from 1928 to 2019. Um, his first show as a producer was Pajama Game uh, in 1955, and it won a Tony Award. He also produced West Side Story, and Funny Thing Happened, which were the first of two of Sondheim musicals. Um, he also produced uh, Fiddle on the Roof. 
Foot on the Roof was produced in 1964, and we talked about how sometimes a musical or a piece will be, will not win a Tony Award, but it'll be an exceptional piece. The thing about Fiddle on the Roof is Fiddle on the Roof is going to become, replaces Oklahoma as the longest running show in Broadway history for many years until Chorus Line comes along. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but Fiddle on the Roof wasn't even nominated for a Tony Award. Hello Dolly won the Tony Award that year. Fiddle on the Roof wasn't even one of the five best musicals to be nominated. And yet Fiddle on the Roof winds up running for almost 15 years on Broadway. Uh, written by two guys, Bach and Harnick, uh, but produced by Hal Prince. As a matter of fact, Hal Prince later was would receive a special Tony Award for the produce, production of Fiddle on the Roof simply because it had been ignored by the Tony Committee when it was actually presented in 1964. Here's a little scene from the movie version of Fiddler, uh, but just to give you the idea of, of the show and what the different uh, the style it had. Just to show the, the the wide variety of music that Hal Prince was into, uh, in addition to producing Fiddler on the Roof, uh, he also produced and directed a musical called Cabaret with uh, Kander and Ebb were the writers, uh, and Bob Fosse was the choreographer. Uh, this is a, a taken from the movie version, which uh, Bob Fosse directed. But I'm going to say uh, Liza Minnelli had also appeared in the Broadway version. So even though Hal Prince didn't exactly direct the movie version, I'm going to say his direction was still evident. And the production that was that was eventually filmed with Liza Minnelli in 72, uh, the, the actual play on Broadway happened in 66. So here's a little bit of my hair from Cabaret. <laughs> To understand the way I am, mine hair. A tiger is a tiger, not a lamb, mine hair. You'll never turn the vinegar to jam, mine hair. So I do what I do. When I'm through, then I'm through, and I'm through. Toodaloo. Bye. Bye. My hair. Farewell, my hair. It was a fine affair, but now it's over. And though I used to care, I need the open air. You're better off without me, my hair. Don't dab your eye, mine hair, or wonder why, mine hair. I've always said that I was a rover. You mustn't knit your brow. You should have known by now. You've every cause to doubt me, mine hair. The continent of Europe is so wide, mine hair. Not only up and down, but side to side, mine hair. I couldn't ever cross it if I'd tried, mine hair. But I do what I can, inch by inch, step by step, mile by mile, man by man, by, by. a fine affair, but now it's over, and though I used to care, I need the open air, you're better off without me, mine hair, 
don't dab your eye Mine hair, oh wonder why Mine hair, I've always said that I was a rover You mustn't knit your brow You should have known by now You'd every cause to doubt me Mine hair, bye bye my hair shows that Halperin's just directed, uh, Evita, uh, about Evita Perone, um, and Phantom of the Opera, were both written by a man named Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, he directed Evita in 1979 and directed uh, Phantom of the Opera in 1986. Now, the thing about Phantom of the Opera, again, when Chorus Line takes over from Fiddle on the Roof as the longest running show on Broadway for several years, but Phantom of the Opera currently is the longest running show in Broadway history. It opened in 1986, and it is still running today. That, if I can't, I can't do math very well, but I think that's 34 years that Phantom of the Opera, every day of your life, my guess, Phantom of the Opera has had a show except on Mondays. Theater is dark on Mondays. So other than that, Phantom of the Opera has been playing. It was directed by Hal Prince. And not only did he direct the Broadway version, he directed the, uh, the London version as well. Uh, of course, Andrew Lloyd Webber was the playwright, the, the composer, lyricist for Phantom of the Opera and Evita. Well, he, he wrote the music to Evita. He worked, as early in his career, Andrew Lloyd Webber worked with a man named Tim Rice. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber was born in 1931, so he is a year younger than Sondheim. Uh, he would be, I would but easily the best uh, British composer of musicals. Um, they had written a small little, uh, Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber had written a small little musical uh, together, they went to the same church and the same school together. Uh, and so one of their first musicals was a musical called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Uh, they wrote it in 68 uh, for their local church. It did remarkably well, so the church took it on tour. Eventually the church uh, helped produce a uh, record album based upon the music that's in, in the Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Uh, they took the proceeds from that and found a producer and eventually worked the show to open in the West End, which again is the Broadway section of uh, London, uh, the equivalent in London. Um, that opened in 72, and then they made a, Broadway, a, a West End album and took the money from that album and wrote their next musical, which was Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, now, Jesus Christ Superstar was an international hit. The album sold millions of copies, and even though Joseph had been written before Jesus Christ Superstar, the first show of Andrew Lloyd Webber's to open on Broadway was Jesus Christ Superstar. Joseph eventually opened on Broadway uh, about 10 years later in 1982. Uh, but Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, again, they started at their local church, did the performance, wrote the, wrote the uh, music, made an album, took it to the West End, made another album, took that proceeds and took it to Broadway for the first time. Um, here, this In uh, 76, it was made to a film uh, here's uh, the conversation between Judas and Jesus Christ from Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm, every time I look at you, I don't understand why you let the things you did get so out of hand. You'd have managed better if you'd had it planned. No, why'd you choose such a backward time in such a strange land? If you'd come today, you could have reached the whole nation. Israel in for BC had no mass communication. Don't you get me wrong. 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 Jesus Christ, who are you? 
top. Now who'd you think beside yourself was a pick of a crop? Udo, was he where it's at? Is he where you are? Could Mohammed move a mountain or was that just me? Did you mean to die like that? Was that a mistake? Or did you know your message that would be a record breaker? Pretty powerful stuff. Um, he uh, has written so far, again, he's still alive, he's written 21 musicals. Uh, he's been nominated for 16 Tony Awards, which again, I would say is more Tony Awards than Sondheim has been nominated for, uh, but he's only won seven awards as opposed to Sondheim, which who has won eight. Uh, he also, uh, uh, Tim, uh, uh, he uh, has written, uh, he's won several uh, Olivier's, um, seven, Olivier, seven Olivier Awards, whereas uh, Sondheim only won a single Olivier Award. Um, so again, that, there may be a little uh, pride and uh, prejudice there from the English stage for uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, fortunately for, you know, Tim Ryan, the, the first musical uh, that they wrote Evita, and then he sort of had a breaking away with Tim Rice. And he turned to a book of poems about cats uh, by T.S. Eliot, and his first musical without Tim Rice was Cats. It opened in 1982. And between, it became the longest running show prior to Phantom of the Opera. So his, he wrote a show in 82, Cats, which ran for 20 years. And then he wrote Phantom of the Opera, which opened in 86 and has run for 34 years. Uh, so he has written two of the longest running shows in, in Broadway history. Uh, Tim Rice did all right, by the way. Uh, he got together with a man named Elton John, who you may have heard of, and they wrote a little musical called The Lion King. Again, an excellent example of a show that did not win the Tony the year it was composed, uh, but has since, now it is the second longest running show in Broadway history. It has surpassed Cats, uh, but it is still behind Phantom of the Opera and is about 12 years behind it. So once Phantom, if Phantom ever closes, it'll still take The Lion King another 12 years to catch, catch up to Phantom. Uh, now, the producer that Cameron, that uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber worked with most times is a man named Cameron McIntosh. Cameron was born in 1946. Uh, to date, he has produced 39 shows on Broadway. Again, mostly he is British, and so he's produced many more shows in, in uh, England, uh, but 39 Broadway shows. He's received eight Tony nominations for those shows and three wins. Uh, he has produced four of the 13 longest running shows in Broadway history, including Phantom of the Opera, uh, Cats, which you can see is number four now, uh, Les Miserables, which is six, and Miss Saigon, which is the 13th longest running show in Broadway history. Uh, again, uh, here's a little clip from my favorite musical, Les Miserables. We're going to see it because it's my favorite musical. So here's a little clip from Les Miserables.
for having uh, advertising that just has the name of the show and the iconic image of the show. Uh, doesn't have any ads, doesn't have any dates, doesn't have, it has the theater located usually sometime on the bottom. Uh, but he's very, his advertising campaign usually is very stark. It's just the logo and the name of the show and that's it and that's how you know it's Cameron McIntosh's show but he, he rarely puts his name on anything. Um, now someone who still writes in the old school manner, uh, again, Sondheim, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber came along and suddenly you, you start writing musicals that are uh, uh, very specific to period and time. Uh, but there's a man named Jerry Herman, who's probably one of the best composers in the old Broadway style, uh, who writes songs and musicals that are just uh, effervescent, they're just happy, they're just singable, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, Jerry Herman was born in 1931. Uh, died uh, in 2019. Uh, he was nominated five times for a Tony Award and won two of them. Uh, his, I would say his, easily his best musical was Hello Dolly. Um, um, although La Cage a Fall is a pretty darn good musical. Uh, here's a little clip from La Cage um, that was done on the Tony Awards and this is the beginning of the show. <laughs>
see, I don't know if you, how much you can tell, uh, but the show happens inside of a club for where the, you have cross-dressers, you have uh, men in drag. Uh, all those young ladies you just saw in that number were all men. Uh, so that's the story. It was the first successful Broadway show where the main character were homosexual couples. Uh, uh, and so that would be a, a, his claim to fame, as it were. Uh, he worked hand in hand with a man named David Merrick as his producer. Uh, David Merrick uh, lived from 1911 to 2000. Um, David Merrick was not a nice guy. Uh, David Merrick was notorious for doing, he was, if you've ever heard the phrase, there's no such thing as bad publicity, that came from David Merrick. Uh, he invented the publicity stunt. Uh, he would do anything and everything to get his name, his show out on people's lips. Uh, he was, at one point, he was doing a show called Circus Circus. Uh, and he closed down Times Square by having these clowns and the, uh, these high wire walkers and uh, everybody walking, <laughs> excuse me, coronavirus, um, walking down the street, uh, congesting traffic, made the news, and of course, it didn't cost him any money, but it, it let everybody knew that he was doing a, a show called Circus Circus. Uh, on Broadway, he produced 88 plays. He also uh, produced uh, five movies. Um, of his shows, Hello Dolly, uh, Gypsy, Oliver, Marat Saad, One Flew with the Cuckoo's Nest, and 42nd Street all won Best Tony or uh, Tony Awards for Best Play or Best uh, 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 com uh, Musical Comedy of the Year. Um, there's uh, notorious, uh, well, I'm going to let you watch a little bit from 42nd Street. Uh, 42nd Street is a very dance heavy musical. Uh, again, just a feel good musical. Watch the little video. <laughs> So opening night of 42nd Street comes along. Everybody's tapping their hearts out. Uh, everybody's very excited because the show is amazing. Again, it was based on the movie from the 30s. Uh, had all these hit songs. Uh, and then as the curtain comes down, the applause start for the curtain call, he comes out onto the stage and he announces from the stage at the curtain calls that that afternoon, uh, the director of the show was a man named Gower Champion. And he announced from the stage, at the curtain call of the stage, nobody in the play knew it, but he announced that the director had died that afternoon of complications of uh, cancer. Uh, and so uh, suddenly, all the newspapers, not just in New York announced that, but newspapers in London, in Paris, in Montgomery, Alabama, not just in Montgomery, not just in Los Angeles, I mean, and in Los Angeles, not just in New York, everybody knew that they were doing a play that had the Broadway opening last night and that the director had died that day and it was announced from the stage on Broadway. That's the kind of guy he was. He would do anything to let you know that he was doing a show. Uh, again, he was nominated for more Tony Awards than any person, uh, 37 different nominations for best play and or musical, and again, he won 11 awards. Uh, so despite the fact that he wasn't very uh, likable, he was very good at his job. Cool. Now, all the people we've been talking about for the last two days have been very profitable in the film, I mean, in the television, <laughs> in theater. Uh, but there's also this thing called not-for-profit theater. People that are not really there to make money, but people that are there because of the art, uh, trying to further the art, trying to make it a, the world a better place. Uh, among the most noble of these is a man named Joseph Papp. Joseph Papp worked as a stage manager for, tele, for CBS television, he worked for CBS Evening News. He lived from 1921 to 1991. And in 1960, he went to the city of New York and he noticed that the people who attended Broadway shows, and again, Broadway shows are very expensive, uh, but he noted that the people who attended theater, uh, who he felt theater should be for everyone, but the people that were going to Broadway shows tended to be people who were uh, uh, able to pay hundreds of dollars for a ticket. And so he went to the, the city of New York, the city council, and asked for money to open up a not-for-profit theater where he could invite the public to see the shows and receive funding and establish the New York Shakespeare Festival. So since 1961, 
Every summer, the New York Shakespeare Festival has presented at least two shows, uh, free for everyone in the park, in Central Park. Uh, they tend to have some major name actors in them. Denzel Washington has been in some, Tom Hanks has been in some. Uh, anyway, different years they have different actors, uh, but they tend to be Shakespeare. Occasionally they will do one that's not a Shakespeare, uh, but they will, and, and sometimes they do more than two. Uh, but it's one of those things when you're in New York in the summer, you try to have a lineup for about a couple of hours before the show, but it seats about 500, 700 people. Uh, but you, if you get the tickets in advance, uh, they have some reserved seating, but a lot of it's just people on the lawn listening to Shakespeare in the park. Um, several years later, it's 1965, he went back to the city government and asked for more funds to open this theater called the Public Theater in Tribeca, which is the south and southern part of Manhattan. Uh, and they received money there. And their goal of the Public Theater is to support new work and new artists. Yes? Now, among, uh, occasionally, I'm not saying every show they do is a hit, but occasionally they will produce something that is worth, I mean, worthwhile. It was a very incredible piece. The first show to transfer from the public to Broadway was a musical called Hair. Um, Hair was the first show to appear on Broadway that had nudity in it, that had foul language in it, um, and it's about hair. Here's a little uh, cutting from Hair. Asks me why I'm just a hairy guy. I'm hairy noon and night. Hair, that's a fright. <laughs> I'm hairy high and low. Don't ask me why. Don't know. It's not for lack of bread. Like. The Grateful Dead Darling Give me a head with hair Long, beautiful hair Shining, gleaming Steaming, flax and waxen Give me a down to their hair Shoulder length no longer Here, baby, there, mama Everywhere, daddy, daddy Hey,
five years later, uh, they started a project uh, in New York uh, where Michael Bennett was a famous choreographer in New York. He had choreographed several musicals, he saw and others. Um, and he got together with a bunch of gypsies uh, in the sense that they were Broadway dancers who moved from show to show. And they recorded little question and answer periods with them. And they developed this piece of theater called a chorus line. Uh, chorus line transferred from the public to Broadway in 1975 and became the longest running show since Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof was a long running show. Well, Oklahoma was a long running show. Then Fiddler, then Chorus Line, Cats eclipsed that, um, and then uh, Family Opera eclipsed Cats. Uh, again, Lion King is the second longest running show currently on Broadway, but it has never been the longest running show on Broadway because Cats was always ahead of it, and then Family Opera's always been ahead of it. Um, anyway, Chorus Line tells the story of these gypsy dancers uh, their backstory about how they became dancers, why they became dancers, all that sort of stuff. So enjoy this little cutting from Chorus Line. Five, six, seven, Theater has continued uh, since um, uh, Joseph Papp's death. Both the New York Shakespeare Festival and Public Theater have continued their mission. And uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, public uh, went to work or allowed a young man to come. And uh, for five years, a man named Lynn Manuel Miranda worked on site developing this new Broadway show that was a, a rap version of the story of Alexander Hamilton. So there was a book about Alexander Hamilton that Lin-Manuel Miranda, who was a rap artist, uh, uh, he had written another musical, In the, in, in the Heights, uh, which is about to be made into a movie coming out whenever they allow us to go to movies again. Uh, but In the Heights was written in, uh, what year, uh, 19, uh, 2008 and won the Tony for Best Musical that year. 
Uh, he also starred in the, mu in the, mu the musical and was nominated as Best Actor on Broadway. He didn't win. Um, but uh, he started working uh, on this new musical, Hamilton. Uh, and here is a video of the opening song uh, from Hamilton. The bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished in squalor grow up to be a hero and a scholar the ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self-starter by 14 they placed him in charge of a trading charter And every day while slaves were being slaughtered and carted away Across the waves he struggled and kept his guard up Inside he was longing for something to be a part of The brother was ready to beg, steal, borrow a barter Then a hurricane came and devastation reigned Our man saw his future drip, dripping down the drain Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain and he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain. Well, the word got around, they said this kid is insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came. And the world's gonna know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. Is Alexander Hamilton And there's a million things I haven't done But just you wait, just you wait When he was ten his father split full of it Dead ridden two years later see Alex and his mother bed ridden half dead Sitting in their bone sick the scent thick And Alex got better but his mother went quick Moved him with a cousin, a cousin committed suicide Left him with nothing but ruin pride Something new inside a voice saying Alex, you, you gotta, gotta fend for yourself We started retreating and reading They retreat us on the shelf There would've been nothing left to do for someone less astute He would've been dead or destitute Without a stance of restitution Started working, clerking for his late mother's landlord Trading sugar cane and rum and all the things he can't afford Selling for he can get his hands on Plenty for the people to see him now As he stands on the bow of a ship Headed for a new land In New York you can be a new man In New York you can be a new man beginnings to where now we're having rap artists sing songs about our founding father. Um, anyway, you'll never know where, what the roads are going to change, how things are going to come down the road, uh, but I promise you Hamilton is, is uh, raking them in still today. It's one of the hardest tickets on Broadway. Uh, and to think that our good friend Lynn manuel 
uh, who also worked for Disney. He's, he's written Moana and a couple of other musicals. So he's, he's still out there working and again, very young. He was born in 1980, uh, which uh, no, I don't think any of you were born in 1980 yet. Uh, anyway, that's the sort of a sense of the type of musicals that we have had through the years. Again, I can't imagine what's coming down the pike. Uh, but these are the, the founding fathers and or uh, people who have created this wonderful thing called American um, uh, Broadway musicals. See you next time.